It's time for some serious reckoning. And I feel really sad and lonely. I'm really feeling very anxious now. What a thing. As they reach out for success and succession, will it be make or break? Food from the streets became a country's pride. The humble, the simple, the complex, the unusual. They fed the good times and the bad. Here at the table are the stories of the people who lined the belly of a nation. Stefan is trying to realise his mother's big dream, but it's turning into a nightmare. Outside, the signboard also saying, you cannot hand over to me on the Saturday, because I'm starting to go My shelf is not done, my shelf needs light, also not done. But it is supposed to finish the renovation like two weeks ago. For so long, Rani wanted to sell her unique vade and other fried snacks to Malaysia. Malaysia, they all put the uh, normal vade only, the Indian vade. Never start the prawn vade yet. The Singapore vade detracts from its Indian origins. Rani's version is fluffy inside, has a prawn on top and green chilli on the side. Only available in Singapore. Her son Stefan took her vade from obscurity into snack spotlight when he blazed a trail of branches throughout the island. Now, the sights are on the peninsula, starting with Kuala Lumpur. It is mother's dream come true. Yeah, before 10 years' time, I tell my Surya before we pass some time, I say, why now we open Malaysia the cell body? Surya said, mother, just keep quiet, mother, no need. Lah. Next time we see, lah, he said. But that dream comes true now. We never think also the dream comes true. There's barely 18 hours until the opening ceremony, with a high chance for disaster. Filial piety runs deep in the blood of hawkers. Many took over the business from their suffering parents. It's the reason why he became a hawker. It's the reason why he became a hawker. <laughs> Tui Kui is a Teochew snack, translated literally as water cake. Its consistency is like a firm jelly, made with rice flour and served with a pork lard garlic preserved radish or Thai po topping. Chili is optional. <laughs> This was one of the street foods sold by roving hawkers in days of old. And that's him in the corner. And that's him in the corner today. Tui Kui is morning food, but the store stays open all day. He's there from seven, surrounded by his mother's implements, many of which were custom made. Many are still in use today. Tui Kui 
The tower of empty moulds is like a beacon of the task ahead. The work is demanding, and few hawkers still make tuikwe from scratch. And for a long while, Mr Lee was without a successor, until Kenny came along. He comes promptly at 8 every day. My name is Chu Songzi. I'm 39 years old. I'm my to make Five kilos of rice flour are used each day. Just add water. The concept is simple. The execution, not so easy. Even for Kenny, who used to work as a hotel chef. When I started learning to make rice flour, because the rice flour sometimes gets too thick or too much water, it's very difficult to make it. Then Mr. Lee is the one doing most of the selling. She's as much the face of the business as Mr. Lee is. Sometimes she can even read his mind. The kitchen gets a little crowded at the next setup. Over the giant wok, nearly 2,000 moulds will be filled and steamed. Teapots were deployed in ancient times as batter pourers. Modern utensils help with the reach, but have questionable ergonomics. When I started doing it, I felt very hot. Because it's very high, you have to pull a lot. And you can't control it. This recipe goes back a few centuries to the Teochews. Original moulds were teacups, then earthenware, now aluminium. Anyone who's tried to steam a fish will know that timing is everything. It's the same thing for chui kue making. Sprains and strains often result from repetitive manual tasks. But even more severe is the danger of gas fire. Sometimes 
เรองวงมันคงอนมังอังอังอเรคือเราพุ่งชงนอเลยไปอ่ะเรียกอีมีสีเขียวไอซ์ไซก็ขาเลยเนี่ยกวาดเลยเนี่ยกวาดกวาดที่กวาดกวาดที่กวาดพวกอะไรปูที่กวาดว้าเด็กเที่ยวจะสิช่วยเสียวเดียวสิแม่ใครบอกมึงบอกแกไงช่วยเสียวเดียวว้าอีตาเล่ไอพัดสังกัดตาเสียงก็จะกลายพันโอเคละบุยป้าหันอ่ะเสียวเดียว Within the hour, it's all done. Many assume that Chui Kui is a reference to the watery batter. Others say it refers to the water that condenses at the top, leaving a desired effect. The dent is a perfect fit for the liao, or topping, which is made of chai po, or preserved radish cooked in pork lard. Special days are set aside for this massive job. Luckily, that's not done today. With a demanding toddler, Kenny's work hours are restricted. He picks up the one and only grandson after school and future proofs him with an afternoon of tuition torture. Both son in law and daughter also have future plans for the Tree Kui business. My goal is to get my grandson to get the Tree Kui. I hope people can eat this kind of food. Another hawker wants to share her heritage. But the recipients have gone MIA. I feel really sad and lonely because everybody is very well equipped with manpower and I am just alone right now. Debbie is a fourth generation zita or short order cook who creates millennial magnetic lunch bowls based off traditional dishes like fish head noodles and prawn paste chicken or ha jiong gai, which is a Singapore creation from the mid-70s and has now entered the local culinary hall of fame. For her friends, Debbie has even made a ha jiong gai pao. For her customers, Debbie creates new bowls to refresh her menu, let off steam and please her supplier. My veggie seller will tell me, eh, hey, uh... We've got a lot of this. Like this week, we've got a lot of this veg. Uh, do you want to try something a bit? Yeah, okay, yeah. So right now, I'm I'm in the chai uh, season. I think there's a lot of chai around. So I decided to do a like a chai dawn, um, coupled with pork slices. Because I realized the lunch crowd likes to have fried rice and likes to have meat, and then the pork just goes on top and then some seasoning, secret sauce. And then we're still gonna have this on top of the bowl. So instead of the regular like scrambled eggs, um, I included chives and onions and some seasoning in it. So I thought, I thought that was a very comforting bowl, yeah. Today, however, Debbie will be catering to a more difficult crowd. She has been actively promoting the hawker culture through school talks. As a follow-up to one, she and other small business vendors are mentoring their students at the school's annual fun fair. Today is D-Day. The fair starts at 8.30 a.m. Lots of people will be arriving, including alumni and the public. Lots of stalls selling lots of different things. Debbie's group is offering ha jiong gai rice bowls and sandwiches. The students are supposed to be doing all the work. Supposed is the key word. I'm alone. I'm alone right now because 
my kids have overslept and I don't know where are they and I'm just mending the booth alone right now and I feel really sad and lonely because everybody is um, very well equipped with manpower and I am just alone right now. The saying, variety is the spice of life, is so true at those stalls where customers get a banquet-style choice of savoury dishes. In Singapore, they call it nasi padang, a misnomer for Malay rice or nasi campur. More like, I guess, nasi should be nasi campur, more like it, yeah. Uh, a local Malay cooking, but they call it nasi padang. Mm. Nasi padang and Malay rice is different, very different. The taste? and ingredients, all the difference. Now it's like, people understand what nasi padang is. You tell them nasi campur, they don't get it. The Wahids run two nasi padang, uh, Malay rice stalls in the CBD. Reda joined the family business with a seldom seen herb-laden rice dish called nasi ulam. It became a success. Today, it's father Abdul Wahid's turn to go creative with grilled fish. Assisting him is daughter Kira. The Wahids rent an extra stall in the back, which they use for storage and umami bomb experiments. It's a fermented prawn paste called petis udang, also known as heko in Hokkien. For a sweet balance, there is a caramelized soy sauce called kicap manis. The sauce is used by the tablespoonful when it flows readily. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Fortunately, there are neighbours. When you plant of the house, you will eat as a minute. Sometimes they show not out stock, they add to my opinion. <laughs> the fish in question is the Asian sea bass, or ikan siakap, or baramandi. First brushed with margarine, then sauced before grilling. The fish, not the hand. And then we must start. This dish is the family's second attempt. The first was manhandled. After a 10-minute cook, a grilling moment for the human, not the fish. It's make or break time. This is a challenge, Thank God. It didn't break on me. Like, you just dull it today. Oh, One down. Fish dishes sold at nasi champo stalls usually come deep fried and on a much smaller scale, like ikan sala, horse mackerel, or slices of batang, Spanish mackerel. Grilled sea bass is a different kettle of fish. We are trying to see how what is the demand for the big ikan bakar. If the demand is good, then we bring in more. If not, we can always use a smaller fish. It's also very nice. The CBD crowd is formed by creatures of habit with well-defined budgets and ideas. Who will buy a large grilled whole fish? The Wahids have the entire lunch hour to find out. For other hawkers, however, lunchtime is for reminiscing. 
In Singapore's and possibly the world's largest hawker centre, the Leongs have just completed their business day. Chef Leung and his family serve rice porridge or chuk and Hong Kong style cheong fan. Working alongside him is his wife, also a trained dim sum chef. Behind closed doors, after hours, Mrs. Leong prepares one of the dishes she used to sell, but had to give it up because of space constraints. Shui Jiao is Mandarin for the Cantonese Sui Gao, often confused with its smaller cousin, the Wantan. Basic Shui Jiao wrappers are made of wheat flour and water, rolled out thickly, enabling a range of folding techniques. You don't do this with a wantan. These dumplings are usually boiled and served in a soup or on their own. Rarely are they pan-fried and almost never ever get a frilly collar. Sadly, Mrs. Leung's Shui Jiao will not see the light of day unless certain changes take place. After months of searching, the family still cannot secure a second stall space. This has forced them to readjust the menu. An addition to their rice milling machine will be other machines which they've ordered that may or may not arrive on schedule. It's a work in progress. The end of the lunch hour is when hawkers begin to eat. Today, the Wahids are having grilled sea bass. A little bit more spicy will be nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trial and error. But I want the fish to be crispier. Baka, right? Too big. But yet we had customers that we were eating, right? There was this two guy who was asking, is this like a, a what do you call that? A special fish you had to pre-order. I said, well, if you want, yeah, you can pre-order, we can make it for you. So one we sold, the other one we shared <laughs> among ourselves. That's where we... But we didn't get to, what do you call it? Quality control. So there was a quality control. By lunchtime, this school fun fair is in full swing. Debbie's students finally show up. No, that was really interesting, I think. Um... The fun fair, named the homecoming event, is a day for the alumni, parents and members of the public. A sizable crowd has built up. Debbie, who was left in the lurch in the morning, has now been joined by her charge of students. 
Uh, I managed to get a friend down for help, uh, for, for some help as well, and she was able to help me organize the kids, and I think that was very, very lucky of me. I mean, I was lucky enough to get a class where some of them actually worked in a fried chicken shop. So, this is like fish in the water for them. Are you the one that worked at KFC? Yeah, no. You also work at KFC, ah? Yeah. Can teach me what KFC do? Like, wow, so I was like, wow. So lucky, I, I don't have to, you know, really like properly go through with them the whole process of uh, how to make sure the chicken is cooked or, or stuff like that. Now, that was really interesting, I think. Uh, managed to interact with so many different kids. I realised it's very different working with younger kids like them because they probably need very clear directions. Yeah, but, but, it's, but it's not like they don't know anything. They have got their own set of thinking as well. Further out east, there's another homecoming. After three months away in New York, Alan Chung returns to his one and only stall in Pasir Ris, which sells hipster prawn noodles. Welcoming him are his chef, Andy, and a fresh delivery of noodles. Because this one, they come every day in the morning, uh, fresh, uh, then they cook later for, for, for afternoon. So everything is fresh. But in New York, it's different. The delivery time is maybe like evening already. So it's always for the next day, for the next day, for the next day. Where is it today? Where is it? There's no one. There's six people. Six people? Six people. 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 New York was Alan's one and only overseas branch. And the experience has given him ideas. So uh, what I learned in New York is to like uh, how to manage a team, team of five or seven, seven people, and uh, planning to apply the same uh, management uh, skill over here to expand the business. Yeah. In Singapore, uh, actually, I'm looking for places to expand really. Manpower is a formidable obstacle for ambitious hawkers, which has stopped many from going further into the business. A situation made worse by the rule that allows only Singapore citizens and PRs to operate or work in government-run hawker centres. Many stay away from the hawker trade because of the thankless hours of chores done behind the scenes. Often, these deal with the necessary prep of raw ingredients. Pork lard, for example, is something many Chinese cooks use and has to be created from scratch. For Mr. Lee and his son-in-law, they have to make it every fortnight. For the next few hours, it's going to be a tight fit at the stall, while Kenny renders lard from pork fat. It's a simple task, just don't burn it. Fry strips of fat over low heat, then stir, and stir, and stir. Out of 65 kilograms of fat, half of it is finely rendered into lard. Teochews call it la, and Mr. Lee uses it to cook the tai po, or preserved radish topping. The remaining crispy la pok is crushed into small bits and added to the tai po. In Malay and Peranakan cuisine, one of the dreaded chores is to make rempa a paste of aromatics and spices. Today, mother and daughter team Filza and Juhana head off to their central kitchen where rempa is processed in bulk. So sometimes when we do the rempa, I take one bowl to do prep all the ingredients. The setup is basic and still a work in progress. Uh, Spoiler. 
Rempas are made from different combinations of aromatics. The most basic would have chilli, garlic, lemongrass and definitely onions. It's a tearful job. Okay, then we add more ingredients inside. The rumpa is then transported to their shop to be cooked and frozen for weekly use. Don't push, I put the black. You push them, eh? You the pan. Okay, off the leg. Off the leg and close the door. This comes in handy because the duo have a menu of 30 dishes or more. Their cooking schedule starts around midnight. Each dish requires a different rumpa like nasi jaganan, another of the specialties based on a hand-me-down recipe. It's also preserved since our great-grandmother also, so we still keep it the same. It's just that the flavour is slightly different. So people may say it is satay sauce, but it's not satay sauce at all. So it's our own uh, special recipe. The rumpa consists mainly of chilli, garlic and tamarind. And like all rumpas, the raw, sharp tastes of aromatics need to be fried out. Then these are portioned out for daily use. Roasted and ground peanuts are added and boiled. So we're gonna get the the janganan cooked lah. Taro garam aja. Stirring is required. So are seasonings like red and brown sugars and salt. The combi oven has shaved off hours from slaving over a hot stove, but not for jaganan. So this is a fast, fast um, uh, process, so we don't want to put it in the combi. Lah. Yeah. In no time at all, the pot erupts and it's ready to be served over rice with a lot of side dishes. Their nasi jaganan set includes Taoge or bean sprouts, garagao or krill biscuit, paru or beef lung, sambal sotong, dried cuttlefish, serondeng, desiccated coconut, sambal balado. What it will look like when squished in takeaway packs leaves a lot to the imagination. <laughs> Presentation is vital for social media conscious hawkers, and one aspect of their focus is packaging. So, uh, the bento style is more on uh, more compartments because we don't want it to be uh, mixed together for each ingredient, so it will last a bit longer. So that, like, if corporate, right, whenever they want to eat, they can it's ready, and also you can microwave safe also. Uh, this is our logo, so we are creating uh, uh, our own boxes with our own design and uh, to create that awareness. Lah. We as hawkers also, we want to create that look that we are also professional in our work. The branded boxes are for corporate events and Filza will be needing them very soon. She has received an order of 200 sets of Nasi Rawan, another one of their specialties. But that's nothing compared to what Stefan has to deal with. He will be giving away 2,000 pieces of Vade at the grand opening of his KL branch. But not all the stoves are working. What else can go wrong? It's mother and son's big day. In a couple of hours, Stefan and Rani will find out if their first overseas brunch has a future. 
At present, they have to deal with some faulty fixtures. They're basically one stove down. Told my uh, my my guys uh, I said that if all else fail, I'm just going to put two, two tables outside and just sell it. The family gathers for moral support as the showdown approaches. Families keep the flame going for many Singapore hawkers. It's especially important for Filza today as she deals with an order of 200 sets of nasi rawan. This is an Indonesian beef stew, but jazzed up with a set of side dishes. For the huge order, she will have to make at least 200 potato cutlets or burgadales. 200 pieces of tempeh, two trays of sambal sotong, at least 10 litres of beef stew, etc, 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 etc. Fortunately, she has lots of helping hands. Besides her mother, her aunt and grand-uncle provide service at the stall. Also assisting them is Filza's father. Now retired, Dawood lends a hand whenever he can. But at this moment, he cannot. Catering helps the business go beyond the confines of a small hawker stall. But it will not solve a manpower bottleneck. Mother Johanna has the benefit of a large family to assist her in the business. But when she and the older relatives retire, Filza will have to tap into other labour resources. It's a conundrum faced by many younger hawkers. I think manpower in Singapore is really hard right now. Generally, people nowadays, they, they, they want to have a work-life balance, right? You know, everybody wants to work in the office, they want to sit in the aircon. Uh, money is secondary. Despite the odds, Alan managed to find resources to open his second Singapore branch. He was a one-man operation until his overseas sojourn. During his absence, his Pasir Ris stall was manned by a manager and his chef, Andy. I teach the main one and the main one go and teach them. Yeah. And he'll manage for me while I'm away to New York. And when I'm back, I will, I will do the managing myself. The second Singapore branch sells both hipster and traditional prawn noodles. That's another takeaway from his New York experience. Uh, whenever I go back to New York, I tend to you know, look for new opportunities to, to, to cater for the Singaporeans down there. Yeah. In fact, recently I just came out with Bak Chor for the for National Day. Bak Chor Mee, or BCM for short, made Singaporean from its Teochew origins. The dry version is the more popular option where thick, flat wheat noodles called mi pok are tossed in a mix of black vinegar, soy and chilli sauce, served with fried dried sole fish, minced pork, liver, braised mushrooms. It's really wonderful. Some, some people are so touched, they, they, they almost cry, you know, when they see bas me. As they say, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And it's so true for overseas Singapore hawkers. So after setting up in New York, it kind of reassured me that what we are doing in, in Singapore, the traditional kaya butter toast and kopi, something which we should preserve. Terry is now ready to offer overseas franchises for his local kopi. The others in the Hawker Centre-ish venue in New York are making similar anniversary assessments. Ellen's fledgling chicken rice business faced an uncertain future in summer, but the chicks are turning rosy in the fall. Well, now things are, are, are better because uh, school reopens, NYU reopens, uh, students are coming back, and uh, the office on top, the new, newly renovated office, uh, the people are back 
Yeah, so, so now, now we are doing good. Working in the chicken rice stall is Cesar. You might remember him as a staff member of Shafiq, who sold Asian burgers and roti john in New York. After one year in the city, Shafiq decided to call it quits. The first six months was fantastic, you know. Uh, every day was busy. We used to hit the numbers, but then subsequently, after a while, it starts to drop. It was said that, you know, I had to make the decision to close. When our neighbours know that we are actually closing now, they actually told us that they are in need of stuff as well. So we actually recommend, you know, Cesar, Tum and, and, and Anderson, you know, to, to actually work with, with our neighbouring stalls. Back in Singapore, Shafiq's neighbourhood Nasi Lemak shop also came to an end. And our contract was, you know, going to, to, to end soon. So we decided, you know, why not close it down and let's just focus on what we currently have, which is Ashes Burnit. One of his ambitions is to open a standalone Ashes Burnit restaurant. A Formula One event brings him closer to his dream. As you know that all our hawker centres, we don't sell drinks. We're actually in the pipeline of starting up a, a drink store called Brewit, which we actually sell like uh, infused coffees, uh, milk foam coffees. Uh, in the near future, I wish to actually have a standalone uh, outlet. So this is something like, you know, a second step towards that. Today, another pop-up hawker crosses a milestone. The family who once survived on the casual Pasamalam format has finally broken through to the other side. They're opening their first ever flagship store here in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. After hiccups and upsets, Stefan and family finally open to a welcoming crowd. Thankfully, everything uh, was sorted out, uh, like most of the things are done. And then, yeah, now it's almost time to open. So, a bit anxious. Uh, I, I can, I can, I, I'm, I'm really feeling very anxious. In the face of friendly culinary rivalries, the acceptance of a Singapore hawker snack across the border is a big deal. For one family, that's one mission accomplished. For another family, it's the end of a long chapter. For close to 70 years, Madam Leong fed generations of Singaporeans with her old school wantan mee. Hailed as one of Singapore's oldest hawkers, she had to close her CBD shop because of the fallout from COVID restrictions. But she never lost hopes of finding another location. However, age caught up with her. Waiting eagerly in the wings to take over is grandson Brian.
，佢煮佢唔會散啊嘛，好辛苦噶做呢啲，知道啊，做食好辛苦噶，唔係好易噶，係有興趣啊，最緊要有興趣，興趣一時就驚你，<笑>要講諗清楚就好啊，諗好諗好先得啦，阿嫲捱咗幾十年噶啦。<笑>捱咗幾十年嘅啦，真係。It will be a challenging pathway for the next generation of hawkers. But accompanying them through the uncertainties will be those who had been there before. Who shared their food, their stories, and recipes in the belly of a nation. <laughs>